What's up, everyone? You're listening to the Hypercast. This is your host, Xavier Evans. This is her co-host, Brandon. This is your co-host, Nathaniel. This is your co-host, Charles. And you're listening to the Kickback Hypercast. Kickback Boys reaching out to you again. We're going to be talking about our top three games this time. I'll be starting you off, followed by Brandon, then Nathaniel, and then Charles. These games are games that we hold very near and dear, and we'll be following a similar outline for each of our each of our games of choice. So, without further ado, please enjoy. So, my first game is obviously going to be Link's Awakening. I've talked about my story called Awakening on Ironically. Well, more ironically. But this is a game that has really touched me in my childhood, and is probably the second Zelda game I beat, and the first Zelda game on handheld that I've beat. And I, I found it watching a Let's Play on YouTube. Mind you, like, back at, like, 10 years old, no, 11 years old, I wasn't too big on Let's Plays, let alone YouTube. I spent most of my time playing video games nearly every single day. And when I came across this Zelda game, because I was looking for Zelda games to play, I, I saw this Let's Play, and this really eccentric guy, I really want to say Chugga Conroy, but it wasn't him. I went back to see. I don't know who you are, but your Let's Plays were so funny, especially for a 10-year-old at the time. So thank you for that. So a little bit about the story. Link has to find the instruments in various dungeons capable of waking the windfish in order to leave the island. The story was impactful, especially after learning the truth of the island. And it hits you so hard after you've made all these connections with the various characters around the island. Like you, you meet like a, a prince, uh, a dumb old man who sniffs mushrooms. A girl who really cares about your well-being and plays a very awesome role in the story. And it, it just hits you so hard once you learn all these things about the island. That's what touched me the most at like 11 years old. Like, I keep going back on 10 and 11 years old, but mind you, I was 11 years old at the time. So yeah, that's probably one of my biggest takeaways from the story for that game. And obviously the game features Link as the main character, as any Zelda game. He has the main role of fighting the nightmarish monsters and engaging in many fun scenarios and living through like awesome battles that you'll see throughout the le- the game itself. So I feel like my favorite feat about this game, like one of my greatest accomplishments in the game was beating an old older Zelda game because the older Zelda games I personally feel are some of the hardest and I would put a link to the past up there. That game was very close to making this list if it wasn't for Link's Awakening and my nostalgia for it. So thank you, Nintendo, for that. I would recommend this game times 100. If you haven't played it, it's a it's a good it's a good little bite. It's I highly recommend you play this game. If not for its story, then for its iconic charm in the Game Boy era. So that leads me to my next game. This is number two for a very good reason. Celeste. I found this game on a trailer on YouTube and it, platforming games have always played like a huge key role in my gaming history and like growing up. Madeline is working to overcome this mountain which is more or less herself. This she's real this really touched me and put me where I am today because Madeline deals dealt with like stress stress and anxiety. Like these things of overcoming herself. And like not accepting herself and herself like eventually like manifests into like its own creature and attacks her down the road. I felt this on a very deep level back when I played the game. And what I learned like throughout that journey of like playing as Madeline and climbing this mountain, jumping wall to wall, using extra jumps to reach different places and explore, overcoming these crazy challenges, you learn that the journey is accepting yourself rather than fighting yourself and appreciating the rewards of overcoming the things that you once saw impossible. So that was my biggest takeaway from um, Celeste. One of the game, one of the huge game mechanics for me was the platforming, of course. This game can be sped, uh, sped run. I do not recommend it because that you'll, you're asking for a headache, but what you can expect most from the game is wall climbing, jumping, lots of jumping, using Madeline's limited dashes to reach higher places or different platforms, 
and working around those limitations in the different environments that the game puts you through. So each room bears its own challenge, and these challenges may take seconds to beat, or minutes, or like me, a whole hour of retries until you get it right. Which takes me to my proud accomplishments in this game. B-sides. B-sides are like some of the hardest things that I've ever experienced in a modern day platformer that provided like decent rewards being like harder challenges. And if it wasn't for this game's like unique graphical style, story and gameplay, I probably would have overlooked these challenges and just called it a day once I finished the story. But no, like I feel like I'm Madeline and I feel like I have to overcome these things just to prove something to myself. And I feel so good after clearing just one room out of the many that are contained in the B-side. Not to mention the music is just amazing. Yes, the the beat the people that they commissioned for the B-side music for are artists that I listen to. Amazing. Like awesome job. It it makes it makes playing the levels so worth it. Heck, I was over at Brandon's house one day and you guys heard that that smooth jazz that kicked in at the mirror stage. Not the mirror stage, but the stage with those platforms that move when you dash. So, would you see the games harder than 1001 Spikes platforming wise? I haven't played 1001 Spikes, nor do, nor do I recall it having like the story with the impact that Celeste It's not really had. a story of impact, but I'm talking about challenge, like how hard the game is. As far as how hard the game is, I find Celeste to be a very balanced and rewarding game. Whereas uh, I often hear 1000 Spikes being renowned for its like insanely hard difficulty. Yeah, you know, like to the in order to even get to the end of the game, you have to go to collect all the gold skulls. One of the most stupidest places you can imagine. Yeah, I mean it, Celeste even gives you an assist mode if you're well, having a hard time. You know, there's no assist mode. The thing, you die, you the have thing, lives too. The thing just brought up the golden strawberries, where you have to do deathless runs in order to get them. Yeah, this looks so stupid to be honest. Yeah, it, why? <laughs> and but cool thing, on Twitter I saw that the developer was working on something. Uh, he mentioned that he was porting something after finishing a... It was a screenshot, and it looked like an entirely new level. I'm really hoping that's what it is, and it's going to appear in Nintendo's um, little direct showing off indie games. So I'm looking forward to that hardcore. Also, Celeste had an Instagram. Where I followed that. <laughs> Theo, one of the characters, was posting pictures somewhat on the daily, talking about his own life. That was overkill in terms of making these characters feel so relatable. One of the best things about Madeline was how she felt like like she had to do this herself and that she had to help everyone. But she had to learn the hard way that you can't please everyone and sometimes you do need people to help you out. Sometimes like you need someone to talk you through your panic attacks or your stressful situations. Accepting yourself and others is probably like one of the greatest rewarding things that you can do for yourself sometimes. So Celeste really stood out to me. So my number one, which un- unsurprisingly is one of my longest written, is going to be Iconoclast. Iconoclast is one of those games that the more you play it, the more you look into it, the more you learn about its backstory and its truth. And it teaches it teaches a theme and it could be a controversial theme but it's an attack on beliefs and that's essentially what an iconoclast is it's a person who attacks cherished beliefs so how did i come across it on a boring summer day i was doing extensive research for a good platforming game to play on a computer i found a trailer for it and it it's colorful art style and awesome looking characters just just caught my eye right away once I was watching the trailer, what did it more justice was it's like showing off its gameplay, puzzles, and bosses. A game with awesome bosses is already a sell for me. A game that plays like a Metroidvania is also a sell for me. I am a Metroidvania whore. And the fact that Robin sort of slightly, somewhat slightly looks like Samus is also a sell. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I love those types of games and... I kid you not, I got it right away. No hesitation. And like recalling thoughts back to my playthrough, Iconoclast is a game with the story of many layers. And the most fun part of that 
is picking apart those layers throughout the story through its subtle, subtle visual hints and its charming character interactions. I find the small interactions between the characters to be like the biggest parts of Iconoclast because not only does it reveal how they perceive their beliefs and how strong they stick to their beliefs, but also shows moments where their beliefs clash or truths are revealed or realities are brought to light that were seen as un unforeseen, like impossible. So that's, that has to be like one of the best parts of Iconoclast's story. Yep. So for the see Brent, I'm gonna get the Brandon when I get to the recommendation part. <laughs> that was fun. That was a fun playthrough. But uh, going to the characters, you have Robin, one of the cutest character sprites I have ever seen. Her animations show her energetic side despite being a mute character. Robin's actually mute because her her father was killed by one of the big uh, protagonist groups in this game, the One Concern, which is a very unironic name. Uh, but that doesn't stop that doesn't stop the player from knowing and understanding how Robin feels in different situations. Her her sporadic like um, sprite animate sprite animations and her movements, her reactions to different things like you can see it in her animations and you know how she feels about different scenarios like the very end of the game where Robin just flops on her bed. You knew she was pissed off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's small things like that that just really stand out for a character that doesn't even talk and you get to see how they feel. There's games with mute characters who struggle to show much of any kind of emotion because they don't have those subtle animations or subtle things that make you go, hey, this person is really sad or very angry or they're experiencing loss right now. Things like that. Like in the Pokemon games sometimes. Yeah. Oh, or it's like I, they just Xavier. have like a blank face. Yeah, that's During too. like a big moment. Hey, Xavier, how about Cave Story? Cave Story. Well, that one isn't... I, I feel that one like is understandable because you're a robot. Yeah, I'm just saying is like he's he's mute as well. And like, yeah. I think I think they explained that he's mute because like the traumas of the war or something like that. Something like that. It was weird. Cave Story was a really close one too. I'm, I I'm, really I'm, wanted I'm to. I'm telling Brandon this. You're gonna buy it on the Switch so we can play that next. Oh yeah, we're gonna play Cave Story next. That's our next Sunday game. Assume I have Sundays. <laughs> so uh, getting back to it, our next main character is Mina. She's a so-called pirate in their world. Mina is. One of, if not the most expressive of the girl best friends, that is the iconic duo. So these characters' bonds really stood out to me and how they challenge this world and utterly change it is amazing to be a part of and experience firsthand. You just... The buildup is so right. There's no, Nothing was rushed. Everything felt like it was happening at the right time. So gameplay me mechanics for Iconoclast that stood out to me. You spend most of your time playing as Robin who uses different guns and her oversized wrench to crank nuts all over the planet. She uses her guns to solve different kinds of puzzles. Using these guns for exploration is often rewarded, which is probably one of the things that I really enjoyed with Iconoclast. Your experimentation with guns and exploration is always rewarded with some kind of treasure test containing a really awesome item that'll let you make a tweak to make Robin even more flexible, like double jumps, uh, meditation. There's there's a lot of cool different tweaks that I've found throughout the series or game. Hopefully it becomes a series. So next, the game, the game took me around like uh, 24 hours to beat. I would say, yeah, on my first playthrough, it was definitely 24 hours, so a full day. And that was because this game is an indie game, and it was, I believe, conceptual conceptualized by one person who had this idea. And it's no short of a great game. This game I could recommend to almost anybody, and I think they'll be able to take something out of its story filled with themes and lore that's just waiting to be broken apart and understood through these characters emotions of dealing with the effects of immortality um ch cherished beliefs that people are scared to give up because 
once there are no beliefs or beliefs of a entity watching over you, there's just the fear of the unknown and death. So people always have something to hold on to. There's so many things in this game to break apart. There's so many moments in this game where the characters get to express themselves and how they feel. I would definitely recommend this game. And I've recommended this game to Brandon, who's who I've watched play through it. We've we even had it so much fun that we voiced all the characters in the story. And let me just tell you, I love voicing General Chrome. I would even do a small bit of me voicing General Chrome in my southern voice, can I, if I can like summon it. So yeah. And then there's me with his like Lieutenant Tolo. <laughs> Tolo the little. <laughs> He's like a, a whiny little shit. <laughs> I love that voice. General Chrome. General Chrome. Now now Tolo. We got we got a job to do. Emancipation. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's Charles trying to Oh my god, Charles when he was Agent Black, no <laughs> but Charles when he was um uh who did he voice? Elro. Elro? A little bit. A little bit. Well you did you No no he, no no he didn't voice Elro. You voiced Elro. He he voiced Elro for a little bit. Charles voiced um the dude that Elro fought later in the series. Uh in the I keep calling it series, the uh, game. The, the one that really looks like buffed an dude. The really buffed dude. You, do you think you can get your Elro voice? Oh. Say, uh, uh, I'm just trying to do what's best for you, Sunflower. I'm just trying to do what's best for you, Sunflower. See, that's his Elro voice. I really like it. All right. Yeah. I, I recommend this game. If you're listening right now, open a new tab, Google Icono Class, pay that $20 or less because it might be on sale and play it now. So that concludes my top three games. All right, now what? on to me. So third place shouldn't be a surprise since we always talk about it. Um, Pokemon Platinum. Now this game is like near and dear to my heart. Um, I came across the title um, from like Easter in 2009. I already had Pokemon Pearl uh, when I got my first DS on Christmas in 2008 or 2007, somewhere around there. But with Pokemon Platinum, I played that a butt ton. And it got me to enjoy Pokemon till today. And I still enjoy the series so much. So like a short summary of the story, which is basically like the same thing for every Pokemon game. Uh, You're you choose a boy or girl and your friend Barry. uh, You go out of the town of Twin Leaf and you pick your starter to go on a Pokemon journey. And then you encounter this uh, evil team called Team Galactic, which they're trying to get the Uh, main legendary Giratina to take over the world and all their stupid stuff. Um, The main characters, of course, you, uh, your rival Barry, and then Team Galactic, and then also the champion Cynthia. Now, speaking of Cynthia, my goodness, I enjoy the music so much. The music that I really enjoy is the final uh, battle theme for Cynthia. I always blast that when I can. Oh my god. I was about to roast you for a different reason. <laughs> um, of course, gameplay mechanics. Uh, catching and battling Pokemon, of course. The main staple of the series. Gotta catch them all. Now, like, I, I enjoyed 4th Gen a lot. Because, like I said, it brought me into the world of Pokemon. Yeah. Um, and it's like all the Pokemon designs for fourth gen I really like because like look at Torterra, Infernape, Staraptor, Luxray. Like there's so many good Pokemon designs. I enjoyed Rotom to be honest. It was simple. It was cool looking to be honest. Yeah. Um, of course accomplish and feats, which I also added catching and battling Pokemon and then 
um, seeing what the world of the Pokemon world shows. Like, it's just experiencing and taking on, taking in that little world that they created. Yeah, and then uh, you played this on the DS, correct? Yep. Yes, I did. There's nothing like a handheld game with a huge world inside of it. I swear, that's that's how you attack my heartstrings. Uh, and then me recommending it, of course I would. It's one of the very few Pokemon games that I, I believe, enjoy a lot. I believe that game contains one of my favorite tracks from Pokemon, uh, National Park. Yeah. Um, so on to my second game. Assassin's Creed 2. Now, the way I came across this title is a friend in middle school showed me it. It was either in 6th grade or it was in uh, in elementary school for 5th grade. But he came over to my house and showed me this one game called Assassin's Creed 2. Um, I had no idea what it was, but put it in my PS3. And then I was just immersed in it. I enjoyed the story. I enjoyed the characters. I enjoyed the game mechanics. I enjoyed everything about it. And this got me to enjoy the series today also. Because like any Assassin's Creed game that comes out, I instantly buy. No matter what. I bought every single one. Assassin's Creed 2, Brotherhood, Revelations... Unity, Assassin's Creed 3, Syndicate, Origins, Odyssey. I played the living hell out of Revelations. That was my shit. A lot of people didn't like it. I loved it. For me, it was a brotherhood, but Assassin's Creed 2 was the one that brought me into the series. And also, it got me to love history as well. Because the main point of Assassin's Creed is going into the past and seeing, like, all the history uh, in the past. Uh, So I'll go into the summary. I'll try to shorten it as much as I can. Um, So it's set in like a fictional history uh, with with an old century struggle between the assassins and the Templars. Um, And first it starts off in the 21st century, follows Desmond Miles, as he rel- relives genetic memories of his ancestor, Ezio Auditore da Frianze. I hope I said that correctly. Um, and when you go to the past, it's in the height of the Renaissance in Italy during the 15th and early 16th century. Let me turn my paper real fast. Uh, the players explore Fro- Florence, Vienna, Venice, Toussaint, and Flora, or Forley, however you say that. Uh, you guide Ezio on a quest for vengeance against his against the people who bet- betrayed his family. Uh, and then Desmond begins to uncover mysteries left behind by an ancient race known as the First Civilization in hopes of ending the conflict between the Assassins and Templars. Of course, the main characters are Desmond Miles and Ezio. Um, The main gameplay mechanics are a third-person perspective with a controllable camera or a 360 view. Uh, One of the main mechanics, open-world environment. So you travel around basically the entirety of Italy with the most known spots. Um, There's the Eagle Vision, where you're able to identify specific people and landmarks. Uh, Then there's Stealth Mechanics, which is the main staple of the series. Um, Then then there's uh, a young Leonardo da Vinci, where she creates new weapons for the players, like adding um, the Assassin's Blade, which one of the funny parts in the story was um, in the past when assassins had to make the assassin's blade, they had to cut out their uh, ring finger for it. Now, Da Vinci said, like, okay, now I have to cut off your ring finger. And then Ezio goes, like, well, okay, just do it. And then, like, 
you think like Da Vinci did it, but he just puts like a knife like right in front of his hand. He's going like, "Don't worry about it. I know a way to do that without hacking off." So the blade finger. just like going through your damn finger, it goes out your wrist. Yeah, you know? uh, because they they actually explain it in Assassin's Creed Origins, which I really liked about that part. Uh, but anyways. Uh, accomplishments, which I enjoyed, is assassinating the targets that betrayed well, your family. One thing I really want to add to your um, game mechanics, too. Yeah. One of the things that Assassin's Creed is known for is having those huge worlds you can travel. And yeah. all those people that fill up the life in the world. Not to mention the collectibles out the ass. Yeah. There's Assassin's Creed, there's going to be collectibles. Yeah. It's a very rewarding game to explore. Never played one, so hey. Well, then I'll go on to recommendations. <laughs> I will totally recommend this game to people who enjoy open world games, now, stealth games. You said this was put into a in PlayStation history. 3. I had a PlayStation 3 when I originally played the game. Okay. Of course, it's on 360 PS3, but then there's the uh, Ezio collection. Yeah, I saw which that. Which is you can buy Assassin's that. Creed 2, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. And Assassin's Creed Revelations. Right. Which I do have, and I played the living crap out of Assassin's Creed 2. Again. I, 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 might, I might give it a try. I, I still have to, speaking of big open games, I still have to go back and finish Horizon Zero Dawn, but I will definitely try out Assassin's Creed. I've been, I was putting that too. Seri- I've been putting that series off so long. I was in a boy too. No. Next. <laughs> so, Damn. on to my final game. Is Sly 3 Honor Among Thieves. Why did I, I... I thought I saw it coming, but I didn't. Even though I know Sly is like your, one of your favorite franchises. I, I knew this this I knew game this series is so close to my heart. My parents can even tell you that. Anytime I played it as a kid, I asked them to like come in my room and watch it. Same. I could relate so hard to that. Same here, to be honest. I couldn't do that. I was a kid. When I played my games, I played them alone. Wow, it'd be depressing. But the way I came across this game was uh, my two cousins showed me it. I I tried to ask my mom uh, to see how I got into the series, but it, it didn't, like, click at all for her. And I it didn't click for me at all. But, um... It was either for preschool or kindergarten that I got into the game series. And that's a long time. What? That is a long time ago. You can't you can really distinguish what's going on. I remember a certain memory in kindergarten. I'm going like, I wish I could bring my PS2 to school and play Slide, slide 2 in on the um, CRT TV wow. that's in the classroom. And my goodness, like... For the Sly games, I played the living crap out of them. You you take me back a very, very long time in my life to a game early in my childhood, Star Fox Adventures. I played that with my entire family. And just so many nostalgic memories of playing that in kindergarten. Yeah, I, I feel that one right there. Now, the summary for Sly 3. It's set a year after the second game. With the Cooper gang and other unidentified uh, characters attempt to open the Cooper Fall on Kane Island. Unfortunately, they're intercepted by Dr. M, owner of the island. Murray and Bentley escape, but a monster grabs Sly. During the scene, Sly's life flashes before his eyes and the game flashes back. So, the whole game is basically a flashback in Sly's eyes. And... Of course, the main characters are Sly, Murray, and Bentley. Now, the main game mechanics. You get to play as, like, multiple characters. But the main characters, like I said, Sly, Murray, Bentley. Sly is a stealthy one where he can um, go on these ledges and, like, uh, walk on them. Um, Go on beams, and he can, like balance himself and make sure he doesn't like fall off or anything 
Yeah. Murray is like the bronze. So he like punches the crap out, out of anything. Um, throws anything. Can grab enemies. Okay. And all that. Bentley is the brains. So he uses like tech to his advantage. So you got a whole team. So with Bentley, uh, he's different from the second game. Which he's on his feet and using like a crossbow of sorts. Uh, now in the third game, he's in a wheelchair. Because uh, when the second game ended, um, when he retrie- retrieved the hate chip from Clockla, uh, the mouth crushed his legs. And he couldn't, and he wouldn't, couldn't move at all. So Murray grabbed him and, like, just ran out of the Ugh, scene. Oh, God. Ugh. Am I the only one whose leg kind of, like, twitched or, like... Nope. Oh, God, that is And, uh, of course, this is, like, a cartoonish game. I yeah, want you to cut off my dark legs. As shit. Please, cut off my legs. Jeez. So, like, the main accomplishments that I enjoyed is defeating the bosses because there's, like, whole scenes where it's, like, before, like, the boss fight starts... During the fight scene and then after. Which, uh, one of the first bosses, Octavio, uh, in Venice, Italy. Which is funny because I just talked about Italy with Assassin's Creed 2. Yeah. But, um, you're trying to get Murray back because he feels it's his fault for Bentley getting his legs crushed and not being able to move again. Um... So he's in this, like, not psychotic state, but, um, he went to this shaman, and he's trying to, like, get peace for himself. So he's not, like, this rambunctious brawn dude trying to punch everything. But, um, okay. I, what Octavio does, he, like, he's like an old lion of sorts, and, of course, all these, uh, the main characters and all the characters in the game is and perform and more morphic animals. Yeah. Yeah. Sly's a raccoon, Murray's hippo, Bentley's a turtle. But uh Octavio was like an old lion. And he like moved like very fast and kicked Bentley out of his wheelchair. And like Murray got so pissed about it. And then Octavio's going like, Well, what are you gonna do about it? You're just a fat old hippo. And then, like, Murray, like, breaks his necklace, and he goes, like, That's it! I'm gonna floss my teeth with your spine. He jumps off a leaf and then starts beating the living shit out of Octavio. And you play as Murray for the boss battle. Wait, is this E for everyone? E10, but, yeah. (laughs) But uh, still, it should be keen at least. Goodness I'm about to floss my teeth with your spine. What the hell? Dark I'm shit. about to play tag using your skeleton arm. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah, as you can tell, like this game series is so close to me. I I just like enjoy like going around the world beating the crap out of the enemies or playing like all the missions and all that. Uh then on to the recommendation, what I recommend the game. I totally recommend this game series to anybody. Of course, this is the third game, but you have to play the first two games to understand, understand the whole story. I'm pretty sure it's like trilogy sets out there you can buy, or like well, a trilogy. Set, there is a say. trilogy set for the first three games. It was on PS2. Then they made a trilogy set collection for the PS3, and then the fourth game released on the PS3 as well. Then. Uh, with PS Now on the PlayStation 4, you can get that and play the collection and then the fourth game as well. Hmm. I might actually try that. But, my goodness, this game series is so close to my heart. All these it, games... It makes me regret not keeping all the consoles I've had in my life. I know, I regret that as well, but... What am I to say? I'm going to go on eBay. That's what I'm going to do. All right, Nathaniel, are you ready? Uh, yeah. So, oh, why? The 
first game I'm going to talk about is one of my favorite games ever. And it's not as close to me as other games are, but this is this is definitely one of my favorites. Uh, it's Dynasty Warriors in general. For specific, I want to go Dynasty Warriors 8. Dynasty Warriors is a telling of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, a book authored by, I'm about to butcher this, Luo Guanzhong. And it's about the Han Dynasty in China falling, and because that fell, a bunch of warlords rise up and try to make a name for themselves and make their own empires and lands. And there's a lot of fighting, a lot of battles, and it's pretty badass. Um, my first encounter with Dynasty Warriors was in GameStop. I was really addicted to Gears of War at this time. Another great series, I recommend. Um, so I was trying, I was in GameStop getting Gears of War 3, and they had like a deal, you buy one game, you get another one for free or something like that. So I saw Dynasty Warriors 7 there, so I'm like, why not? Let's see what Dynasty Warriors is about. I heard good things, so I was like, okay, threw it in there. I didn't even touch Gears of War. I didn't touch Gears of War 3 for a week, because I was too addicted to Dynasty Warriors 7. Played that shit. Dana, my uncle was trying to pry me off the TV to get me to do shit, because I was just so addicted to this game. And it's like, it wasn't just the comet either. The how story did, engrossed me too. I didn't think it would. How did that lead you to 8 though? Okay, so, because the thing about Dinosaur is it's, it's the same story with each game. Just a slightly different retelling or they added new things or took some things away. So about a year later, which was pretty much last year, uh, I bought the complete edition of 8 because I played the Shadow 7 and I was like, wow, this is really good. And 8 is the best version you can probably get of Dinosaur Wars. In 7, a lot of characters felt samey. They were moved out in 8. Everyone has a unique weapon. Everyone plays differently. It's so fun to play with. You can master specific characters. It's pretty great. As far as the story goes, you got... In Dinosaur Warriors 8, you got five major, let's say, factions would be the best way to say it. Trying to make a name for themselves. You got the Wei Empire, led by Cao Cao. He just wants to rule the land through strength. And, you know... Yeah, I can't describe that. He wants a freaking empire. Yeah, he wants an empire. He wants Kong he Kong. wants to rule an empire. Uh, you got Liu Bei, who wants to rule the world through benevolence. Not the world, China. Through benevolence and nice and everything. Everyone's all peaceful. Everyone loves each other. No violence. And then you got uh, Sun Xuan. He wants to be left alone for the most part. He just wants to do whatever is good for his people. He literally sounds like Claude, but I'm <laughs> not going to get just, into that. He just wants to do whatever is good for his people. And then you got the two others. You got Lu Bu, who just wants to carve a path to his own empire. Like, he wants to get to, to force. Just kill everything in his way until he reaches the top. That's his mentality. All right, you got Dimitri now. And then uh, for the last one is the Jin Empire, who is ruled by Suma Zhao. He was the laziest of his siblings, and yet the empire is just thrust upon him, and he's told to lead it. Thrust. Yeah, like his siblings die, his father dies, and his brother dies, and he's told to lead, and he doesn't know a single thing about leading. Shut up, Xavier. The way you said that, it's like, you just wake up, hey, everybody died and you're the king now. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, it's time to wake up cowboy? No, it ha in both times, uh, his father dies, so his father has like the sword of the people, he just throws it to his older brother, he's like, here, uh, well, I'll leave the rest to you. And the same thing happens when the older brother dies. He's like sick on his day. He's like, here, toss the sword and zoom it out. I leave the rest to you. And he's just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I think it's one of the better character developments out of all of them is how he evolves into the leader of his people. But beyond that, uh, in terms of gameplay mechanics, it's really fun. You're thrown into a battlefield by yourself. Well, not really by yourself. You do have friends around, but you're practically by yourself and told to kill things. So as you far see as that game mountain? Take that. <laughs> so you're taking territories, something like it's that. Taking territories, you're defeating enemies. You get like cool attacks. You get cool weapons. And like with the Warriors games, it's like uh, enemy captains. You have to claim certain areas. Yes and no. Um, Pending. You also, uh, uh, I'm umming and I don't like it. <laughs> so, one moment, which is one of my favorite parts within the game, is uh, you're playing as the Way Empire. And you're playing as one of the generals, or Zhang Liao. He's a monster of a man. He used to serve under Lu Bu. He has, like, dual axes. He's charged with defending this castle known as Hefei. And an uh, enemy force led by Sun Xuan comes at him of 10,000. He has 300. So what does this man do? He runs out into the battlefield by himself and wins. 
and you get to play that moment of you by yourself facing a gigantic force of enemies. And you just feel so badass doing it. Hmm. Slaughtering people. Would you recommend this game? Hell yeah, though it might not be everyone's cup of tea, so to speak. Um, the game has a few flaws. Like, uh, there's no really good reactions for hitting things. It's a little slidey if you catch my meaning. Like, I might hit you with a yeah. sword, you'll just move back rather than... Ugh. You okay. just, like, slide back a bit because you got hit by the sword. It's just... It lacks impact, I guess. Oof. Okay. But the story is always amazing. See, story is where I look to most of the time. So what's your number two? Okay, so number two... Originally, Dynasty Wars was my first, but I found out that I had more to talk about the other two games. So, my number two is... No, not that one. Uh -huh. Oh my one. Spyro Year of the Dragon, otherwise known as the third of the trilogy. And that can be for both the original and the reignited versions. They're both great. Um, so, I encountered this game when I was like 10 or 11. Uh, we didn't have much, but we did have a PS2. So I decided, hey, uh... I'm tired of going outside and being bullied. I want to play a game. I really didn't play games for us. In fact, this was the first game I've ever beaten. And this is also the first game I've ever beaten 100%. And so, I started this game. And I didn't put it down for three days straight. And that's not because, like, I, uh... No, no, I literally didn't have a choice. Uh, we didn't have a memory card. So I had to keep the machine on for three days straight while I beat this game. And I perfected it without a memory card. And it was... So sad when I finally had to turn off the PlayStation. Because I was like, here goes all my progress. <laughs> but I kept this machine on for three days straight, which is not good for PSU. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. But uh, in Spyro the Dragon, you, you're the dragon, you play a Spyro, and his, uh, life, his dragonfly life partner Sparks. And they're tasked with finding the eggs, the dragon eggs that have been stolen from them. So they go into what's called the Forbidden Realms, and they go from world to world, hub world to hub world, finding eggs all around. Yeah. So um, the game mechanics, it's a collect-a-thon, it's a 3D platforming collect-a-thon. Uh, there's platforming, there's challenges, there's mini-games, and you use your reward with gems, eggs, or more life points for your character. Well, I know there's like mostly hub worlds and Spyro as well. There's four hub worlds in Spyro 3. Four hub worlds and then like the levels themselves. Yeah, there's four hub worlds and in order to access another hub world you have to beat most of the... Yeah, you have to go through all the little worlds in that world first and then beat the boss to get to the next hub world. Most of the bosses are easy. Um, I remember I always had trouble with this one boss. It was uh, when I was getting to the fourth hub world, the one that blocks away is this giant bat monster who shoots at you. I really didn't like it. He was actually the stuff in Nightmares too. You know what I'm saying? I played this but everything was polygonal. So like there was fangs and like brown and everything and it was scary as shit. Like that image is forever burned into my eleven year old mind. Yeah. So in terms of accomplishments, I uh, already told you I hundred percent of the game. After I beat the final boss, I found out there's like a secret world. You have to get literally everything in the game. So I had to go back through all the worlds I may have been through, and just collect everything. Once that, you get a secret world that has even more to collect, and then I collected all that. 100% of the game, and I was really proud because it was the first game I've ever beat, and the first game I beat 100% at the same time. I was proud as hell, and I'm always going to be proud of that achievement. And I would recommend this to a lot of people. Uh, the problem with Spyro, though, is I find that a lot of people don't like it if they don't know what Spyro is. You know, my, if you don't know much about Spyro, you probably won't like it regardless. My first and only exposure to Spyro was um from second grade in... Yeah, elementary school and I there was a Scholastic magazine you know how they used to sell like not only books and magazines but also games I talk about like the Scholastic yeah. book fair they had <laughs> well not the book fair the order books oh, oh yeah oh my god I got my parent I, I got my parent to order me Spyro because I just wanted a game because I had a DS at the time no and yes you did yeah. not play that one I played that one one of those is good. There's like two of them that are made for the DS, or essentially they were Game Boy. I enjoyed it. One was, was really it for bad. The one was DS good. Or was it for the Game Boy? It was Game Boy, but DS could play that stuff. Um, oh my god, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Was it the one where it's like Crash and Spyro, or was it like a different Spyro game where it's like top down? It was a top down. There's Spyro two game top down like Spyro games made for the DS or Game Boy. I guess we can look it up later. I forgot the names of it, but I, I played the hell out of one of them, too. Yeah. Uh, not, not bad, just kind of difficult. Anyway, I'm going off track again. 
So I guess I'll go on to this, my third game. So is this your third rated game or your first rated game? My first game? rated game, I guess. Okay. And this is one that recently came up, and you've heard me talk about a lot, and that is Hollow Knight. So, I came across this on a whim. It was more like rumors, and I've only seen like one trailer ever. Slight gameplay here and there. But I've heard a lot, I heard a lot of good things about the game. So I was like, I'll give it a try. Um, it's $15. So I was like, why not? And yeah, I uh, I didn't get addicted right away. It didn't hook me in right away. But that's because I didn't get the mechanics right away either. Hollow Knight doesn't take you by the hand at all. Again, it just thrusts you in the Grabs world. Grabs you by the balls. No, doesn't even do that. It Stop. Just... <laughs> Xavier? <laughs> it just shoves you down a hole and tells you to go exploring. Have fun. That's literally what it does. So reverse birth. <laughs> Xavier, are you trying to be Why? me? I've been trying to stay quiet this entire time so I don't ruin people's you thoughts. You pulled it, Charles, damn it. No, oh, no, I think that was beyond Charles. But, uh, yeah, you're told to explore the hollow nest, it's called. You yeah. play as not the Hollow Knight, but a Hollow Knight. The Hollow Knight is like your end game goal, you could say. But as a Hollow Knight, you're just told to explore the Hollow Nest. Essentially, where you're from originally, you've come back for unknown reasons. It's never really explained why. You just find out more and more as you explore these different biomes and like fight these different bosses and enemies and stuff. And that was pretty amazing. The music is also amazing, it's dynamic. So it changes based on what you're doing, obviously. It changes biome to biome, boss to boss. And I enjoyed it heavily. And um, the game also invokes a lot of feelings. As you're going through this uh, ruined kingdom full of, like, dead bugs and, like, ruined castles and stuff. But then you see, like, the few ones that are alive that are left to tell a tale. And even they can't remember all the details. And, like, sometimes I felt sadness. Um, when I was in areas like the Deepness, which is, like, the creepy crawly area, I felt itchy. Oof. Yeah, it's really good with evoking. So the game's aesthetics stuff. really get to you. It really does, and you wouldn't think that from a two D platformer. It's definitely. That's it what is. I was talking about with like Iconoclast. Like it just takes those subtle things and doing them right. It is what I'd like to call a true Metroidvania. It does everything a Metroidvania should. You got collectibles, upgrades, upgrades you gain from collectibles, uh, powers, uh, weapons. You, you even got what's called the charm system, where you could gather these charms and it can change your fighting style completely and I enjoyed that heavily now um, in terms of accomplishments I haven't even beaten the game yet and I'm 30 hours in my first playthrough I'm still going through it it's and that this, this game was just a $15 indie game that was like Team Cherry the creators they did that themselves they're not they're self-published too so it's not like they have anyone over them they put it on $15 on purpose the game is practically immune to criticism because of this well, I, nothing's immune to criticism okay I shouldn't say immune. Immune. I should say resistant, if anything. No, I, w I would just say it's impressive, and it's a feat to be known. And it's a, you're getting your money's worth. You're definitely getting your money's worth out of this. It's fifteen dollars for what is considered a thirty to forty hour game your first time through. Not to mention you got three free DLCs that are already in the game. And that I just. Fit, Dude, I, I can't tell you how much I love these indie games that are... I mean, price aside, like, yeah, these games are around, like, 20 bucks. You get so much content out of these games, and it... If you compare it to, like, some other games, like, it may feel even more so like you're getting even more out of these games than others. Like, Celeste, there is no game that I've spent months on for... That, that was, at like, around $60. I, I, I just can't recall Isn't any in Celeste recent Celeste like 30 bucks, 20 bucks? Celeste was $20 for me. Yeah, 20 bucks. Now I have like two things to add to this. Um, one, with like not completing like the game yet. I would have added Persona 5 to my list, but I'm like almost done with the game. And I feel like to me, I feel like I should complete the game before I add it onto my list. Definitely. Now with like the price point for games, for me, it, it adds up to like how many hours I put into the game. So if, well, I wouldn't say hours. I would say content. Well, for me, it's like uh, hours played and like content wise. Yeah. So like for me, if like the games, like, uh, ten uh hours long, but it's only like, it's like sixty dollars. 
because everyone plays games differently and you're not expected to do every single thing along the way. That, that's just me. Yeah. Well, that's what I enjoy about Hollow Knight is one player's route is going to be completely different from another player. Right. I kind of like weigh it based on like the gameplay you're getting, the levels you're it's getting. It's also a lot like Celeste in where each death you're learning. You're learning either another pattern to the boss, uh, a charm you may need to defeat this boss, or unfortunately the fact that you may need to get stronger before facing this boss. That's just how it is. And with Hollow Knight, it's also subjective in terms of difficulty. You may steamroll a boss that one player had the hardest of time with and then get, like, difficulty walled at another boss where another player just broke him in one try. <laughs> but then there's the one that one boss that everybody hates. For another episode... No, screw it. Nightmare King Grimm. Everyone will agree. The entire fan base will agree. That boss sucks. Hard. Sheesh. So one boss, everyone agrees. That's such bull. I won't go into detail, but it's bullet hell in a nutshell. Oh, no thanks. But yeah, I would recommend this to literally everybody. I will scream this from the top of the heavens. Out of this all is I've, worth it. Out of all I've heard so far, this is probably going to be my first most, like, priority try. Like, buying this Play game. it. You, Play I, it. <laughs> I, I, I have a soft spot for niche indie games. It's also, yeah, it's a niche indie game, and it's one of my favorites. Um, no, my favorite, yeah. It's my favorite indie game I've ever played, and probably my favorite game of all time. Nah. Yeah. Not shooting down AAA games. I, I enjoy all uh, my AAA, AAA games. Are always fun. You know, you're expecting you expect them to be good, and they're always good. Most, most but like with indie games, you don't know what you're getting when you buy a few of them. Right. Like you don't it, know what it, kind of it could be a pleasant surprise. It, it could be a pleasant surprise or the worst thing you've ever seen. Something that mortified you for the rest of your life or a hidden gem. You, you just never know. All right. So I have taken way, way too long. So you, Charles, you, you, you did go. you did just about okay. You did you did good. You did good this time. I won't. I'll shoot you down. <sighs> I tried to say Simon because I was afraid I might get some people off track because of my randomness. Now it's so, on to Charles. As long as you follow our awesome outline, you will yep. be good. No, I thought about when you guys were talking about your games. I don't want to say much. But ruin the flow. As, as long as you don't. Sometimes. Okay, first game, which would be third place, is a game that I played as a kid, Final Fantasy IV, for the Game Boy. When I was young... I would I played Pokemon a lot and I got bored of it. I got really bored of it. I did everything in the game. I caught a shiny. I caught Mewtwo. I got very bored. My aunt saw how how bored I was, how easy the game was, so she let me Final Fantasy IV and told me to have fun. That game was an emotional train train probably my first emotional train wreck I've actually played of a game. Cause the game the game was something else from when I was a young kid. The story is follows the main character Cecil, who was a dark knight at the time, and his buddy Kane. They get told by the king to go to this like, village of summoners. It's like, oh, okay, no big deal. Er- uh, also, earlier Kane was stealing crystals, and now he's told to go to this village for some reason. Okay, he goes to the village. Turns out the amulet he brought with him as a peace offering or something was was actually a bombs and blew up the village. You met then you meet this girl, right? Yeah, right? Yeah, right. I can never say her name. Let's just call her best girlfriend right now, but... She summons a titan and completely curve stomps her ass. In the DS version, you can do nothing about it. In the Game Boy version, if you grind enough, you can actually beat her, but... Long as short is, you then wake up in the middle of the desert with this girl, and now you have to go find a town to take her and help her out. Then the whole story goes from this story about you being this dark knight to you finding crystals and going to the moon fight a being of destruction like oh, okay sounds like Final Fantasy and probably why the game was most a train wreck for me was when Kane betrays you like as a kid I was so I was so emotional wrecked because of Kane betray- betrayal you thought it was Kane but it was <laughs> yeah, ideal I, I feel, going back to my Link's Awakening like the story kind of hits you harder when you're a kid for some reason yeah okay now stuff that's interesting it's, just, it's a turn based game I like the game it was turn based it was old fashioned you you had a speed you load up blah 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 pretty much it's a it's a oh, it's not turn based it's not really there's not really much going on it, I like I liked it it was nice it gave challenge you guys had to play out your character's turns right and stuff like that accomplishment beating super boss as a kid I would definitely make that this game doesn't even tell you how to fight the super boss all you know is that's it you beat the game the, the, the story 
turns out if you beat the game of all the characters, and this includes Edward and Sid, who are literally, Edward is just a bard, and he's not that good. And then you have Sid, whose Pardon? only ability is Antilize, which is the, the scan spell. That's all he has. So you have to fight the final boss repeatedly of all the characters, and then you go back to the final boss. And instead of the normal final boss theme, there is scene everything, no, it's just a single fire. Be mad at you. Then you have to fight your boss who starts off the battle by spamming mini, by spamming mini and quiet. You're dead, pretty much, first turn. You have to cast like reflect and all that to beat this your boss. I beat it as a kid. I was like eight when I beat this. And this boss was ridiculous. And then about the DS version, and I couldn't get past the lunar base. Yeah, because hard mode. I feel like there's also this phenomenon too. Things I don't understand how I beat as a kid, I cannot beat now. Oh no, the DS version's hard mode. The DS version's actually hard mode. Oh, I can beat this. I beat this game before. I think you showed no. me this game one time. Yeah. yeah. It was actually when I actually figured out how to write his name. It's like, I love the game, don't be wrong. It's just. Is it just called Final Fantasy IV? Final Fantasy IV. There's it's also a sequel to the game as well. Which is interesting because most Final Fantasy don't get a sequel, but it has a sequel, so. Would I recommend this game? Yes, I would recommend this game if you're looking for old-fashioned games. Do would I recommend the DS version? No. Do you recommend the Game Boy version? Yes. Does the DS version take away anything mechanically? No, no it's, it adds stuff. It actually adds mechanics. It's just the DS version is hard mode, so the Lunar Base looks like insta kills you by having three enemy spam blaze at you, doing two thousand damage. There's a piece. still difficulty options, right? No. The Game Boy was easy mode because Americans couldn't handle it, and the DS was hard mode, which was originally released in Japan. Huh. It's like lost levels, huh? Basically, but well, basically, but cancer. All right, next game. Next game is a game you guys have probably heard me talk about a lot: Darkest Dungeon. Ugh, I uh, lo love that goodness. game. I thought you were gonna say Pet Scott. But no, okay. but Darkest Dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> Xavier, I already told you about that. But Darkest Dungeon, how I got introduced to it was actually by a streamer, Vinny. I, oh yeah. I when he played it, I was like, oh, I could, I could, be, I could do better than him. So I got on my way, bought a computer, and played the game. Well, I actually played ma my first profile was mainly on the school's computer, but I pretty much, <laughs> yeah, that's where my first profile was, and I beat that as a kid. Uh, not a kid, but when I was like teen, like, oh, I can beat this. I, I did better than Vinny. I actually beat the final boss. Rest in peace, rest in peace, everybody, because the final boss kills two of you. But uh, besides that, I beat the game. Like, okay. Okay, okay, it's pretty much the story is okay, but then the story, it's pretty much the story is you get brought to this town Like yeah, your ancestor left you this town go have fun. What do you do? Oh, yeah? He summoned the abominations from hell itself and now you have to deal with all of it have fun While there's demons that look like monstrosities sirens can't like cannons hags flat flesh creatures and a heart of literal darkness is... So if you can't tell yet, this is a very dark and gruesome themed game. Yes, dark fantasy, how well. Yes. Why this game intrigued me was mainly because it wasn't the main game. I beat the first story, I was, like, I, was, I was like, cool, is that it? Then I found out this game has mods. And that's where I fell in love with the game. You ruined the game because of your mods, you realize this? Yes. Literally, the mods can literally make the game so different, because it, it adds so much diversity, it adds more bosses, it adds more... I love the modding community in this series. It, it all was, I saw was big titty anime women because that's all you had. Stop. On. <laughs> that that, that explains what I saw in school. No, I was fucking with you guys. Actually, the worst part is I was fucking. I was like, I was fucking with you guys just to see. But then if you actually see my actual profile, it's mainly just it's mainly just slayers and I literally downloaded every mod possible. Okay. See, I had almost I have almost every mod possible that doesn't won't crash my game. I'm glad you had fun with that. Oh, it was fun. It, what anything in, in, interesting mechanics? <laughs> interesting mechanics. Probably the best mechanic. Probably the best mechanic is stress. The stress mechanic I love to this day. Still. So. Oh yeah, there was something like stress. Like characters would, would stress out. Yeah. And like get to hundred stress, they would freak out. Either they would freak out and get abusive and start killing their teammates, or they'll become they'll get a virtue and be good boy. But most of the time, you had a seventy five percent chance of getting a getting a bad effect. So long as I showed us. Here's your party. Here's your healer. She gets 100 stress. Now she's abusive. Now she's gonna beat. You. Now she's gonna beat your party to death. Yay. Jesus. Yeah. So you have to watch everyone's mental health while you play the game. Yes. Jesus. And if you get 200 stress, they have a heart attack. God. Therapist of the game. Yeah. It's like one bar of stress, and then your people either get a virtue or a bad state. Or affliction. 
affliction. And then and the second bar of stress, new people die of a heart attack. Yeah. Oh, so it's just wild magic. All right. Accomplishments <laughs> in this game. I beat the game on normal mode, and I'm playing the game again on normal mode, but with mods, and I have done almost every mod possible. Is uh, My accomplishment is having my game stay in one piece after having like over 80, 200 mods. All right, my game's Charles, still one piece. You spent way too much time on this game. I love it, sorry, but... Yeah, I, I, oh, I can understand. Any, would I recommend this? Yes and no. I would recommend it if you want to seek for a challenge, but if you're a casual player, I would not recommend this game. This game is abusive to every... Plus, abuse. I, I would recommend it to people who like Dark Fantasy. If you like Dark Fantasy, that's another thing about this game. is It's really dark and gruesome. And the mods just add more darkness or straight up actually add more sexual themes, which is what made it, which makes it so. Like, I'm still mad, but other than that, it adds a lot. That's why I like yeah. about the mods, the modding community. It adds so much. I have every mod class possible, but that's a different story. Yeah. Okay. The next game, which is a game which this I is your number one, right? This is my number one. This is this was probably the most interesting way of. You guys have heard me talk about this game a lot, and that yes, would be the Boys Blue series. Mm. Yeah, that series is still probably my favorite. It's a fighting game, and that's shocking from somebody who I just recommended two RPGs, but now my favorite game of all time is a fighting game. It's not the fighting I fell in love with. It's the characters. It's how each character is... How I discovered a series was an interesting mistake. When I was young, I liked anime. So I would look up anime pictures a lot and use as profile pictures and stuff like that. I don't know why. But, I mean, we were all 12 at some point, Charles. Yeah, we're all... No, this is like, I was 10. What the fuck are you talking about? I, I, <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> but long to short is, I ran across this character. She had an... She, she looked very interesting. I literally had an obsession looking for this character nonstop. I literally searched the entire night for this character. To, and, and, and when I found this character, her name was New. New 13. And that was a character that introduced me to the whole Boys Blue series. Why did I love this character? She's a psychopath. She's cr not psychopath. She's crazy. She's a nutcase. I already had guns in my head, but I found the series through her, and pretty much I fell in love with the character. And that character is probably far as my one of my favorite characters of the series. Not that hose, but okay. Why are you using that defiled word on my Christian stream? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> my problem was, this is my biggest problem to explain, is the story of this series. The Boys Boo, Boys Boo, um, Chrono Shift, Calamity Trigger, Chrono Phantasm, and Central Fiction follows the story of Ragna, and, his, and, him, and him breaking every bone in his body. Long as the short is, here's our main character, Ragna. He had, well, I would say this, he had a, he has a brother and sister. He was at a church, he was adopted at a church. Long as the short is, his sister was cloned. Oh. And that's where New comes in. That's New's one of the many clones. There's four of them that we actually see as characters, but that's beside the point. Ragnar destroys that, blah, blah, blah. He counters the Azura Grimmore, which is a forbidden... It's, it's hard to explain. All I know is he gets the Azura Grimmore. Now he's a bounty of like five million... A lot of money. A lot of money. A lot of money. And almost every organization wants to kill him, wants to kill the Reaper. He's he, His nickname, his, his name is the Grim Reaper. What kind, of, so what kind of game is this? It, it's like a fight. It's a fighting game. It's all right. And he follows you going through Ragnar's and his abuse of hell of him getting abused by every possible character, thinking he's a bad guy. Everybody thinks he's the bad guy, but Ragnar's a guy, nice guy. He's just misunderstood. So he's an anti-hero? Not really. Well, he is an anti-hero because as the series goes on, I might be at the crucial point of the story. And okay, as the series goes on, you fought Ragnar, and then you hit the end of the story. New, he meets up new. New fights him, stabs through his chest, and they both die. What happens on the other hand is thinking, oh, they just die. No, new, the Black Beast is summit in the story of the world. Hmm. The thing about the series is, one of the gods, I won't explain what much about it, restarts the world back 100 years. So literally, this, it, it, the whole world is in an in a internal loop of 100 years. So the main story is focused on all the characters who do remember them going through 100 years. Example, a character, Nine. She got killed by Teremy, the actual villain of the series. She has to go through, imagine this, she, she breaks down. She literally, when you meet her up with her in Central Fiction, she's broken, she's insane. Why? Oh, she had to witness her family and everybody get died millions of times, repeatedly, just dying over and over again. Thanks. And she's pretty much broken. And this is probably where my favorite character comes to play, Jubei. But best boy, best cat. And why I love this, it, it, 
The series is good because it's so dark. It's dark at the same time, but it's not. It's it, it's cutesy, but it's dark. And my favorite character is Jubei, and he is and he's the husband of Nine. And it's probably why I love the series even more. <sighs> and just, main characters, main characters. I just are pretty much the entire cast. The entire cast is the main character. Yeah, because fighting games tend to have a lot of characters, and they're somehow there's intertwined 40, with the story. It's like there's a lot of characters. Each character is own, their own main character of the of their own story. That's why I always found the series yeah. actually Jubei being my favorite is, of all the main characters. Is there, is there at least like two lead characters? Ragna and Noel. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Bye. Bad. Ragna and Terami would technically be the correct term because Terami is the main person who causes all the events to happen. Okay. So the big bad boss. But he's never the he's never really the main focus of the big bad boss until the very end of the game, which is was interesting because his character looks like this. He laughs. He's think think the Joker. He's literally the Joker. But I had a Japanese guy got a hold of him. Okay. He causes chaos. He and it's pretty basically much, a Yakuza version of the Joker. Pretty much. And out of all the main characters, I would say Jubei's my favorite because I like his character. He's he always holds back. They never he never shows his full power. And he's like and he even when he fights his daughter, he's just, his daughter's like you're, you're holding back. Even when he fights nine and most most saddest scene ever of him having him kill nine, he's holding back the entire time. Holy crap. And he's and, uh, that, um, the, this is probably why I think why it's a big deal. He's going back. This is a series where every character can pretty much make their own realities, bend space and time, and he's holding back against these people and he's beating them. Hmm. So that other main character, Ragna. Yeah, he is the main character. It, the the, the Blaze Blue series follows main Ragna's main character. Okay. Now I'm not gonna explain what happens at the end, uh, but pretty much he fights Terry, and Terry is also is apparently this black big so villain. How has this game impacted you? What made it your number one? The characters. In most games, this is why I get picky of games. I love how Blaze Blue and developed each character. Each character is like it makes me want to develop characters. It makes me want to like I it makes me where I like, I even flesh out random like when I, you see me if you when we play D and D, you guys see how much I flesh out a character. I got my character. I just flush him out. That pretty much one shot D and D where you played as that jester. You had like a whole three page back summary that you wanted me to read. No, but I didn't want to. I was like, I was like nah, I read. I, you wrote a whole story for this man. That's how in depth you get with characters in a moment. Yeah, it's it's a flaw at the same time, but I get really in depth with characters. Like it made me want to just it, it it made it also changed my also changed my taste in the actual female characters and most things. As we noticed with Rhea, I like the psychopath characters. I like the I like the psychotic characters. I like the characters who are just uh, on emotional wreck. Those are my favorite characters. Xavier just appears okay on Death's the outside. Theory. No, it's okay. We, we but yeah, all... that's actually where my, my general taste of I, I like the psychotic characters more than anything. Uh, that's why yeah. I like Terry so much because he literally is a he literally is a oh, yeah, I'm the villain. I can kill gods with the power of math. Three plus two equals death. Pretty much. It's my final move. But, yeah. That's <laughs> interesting mechanics. Honestly, unlimited characters. Yeah, they got rid of them in Central Fiction, but Chrono Phantasm, unlimited characters was the funnest thing ever. Imagine playing the final, imagine playing a boss version of a character. Huh. It was so much fun. Just a more powerful state of them? Yeah, then we have Hawk. Basically, mm -hmm. I explained one of them. The one of the most broken of all the characters, in my opinion, is still Hawkman. You, you know how in most fighting games you can walk? Yeah. Yeah, he can counter that. That does a third of your HP. What? He can counter you breathing. Oh, you breathe. I can counter that. All right, all right. Moving on before we get into that meta stuff. <laughs> no, but so just, would you recommend this? I would actually definitely recommend this. This is a fighting game where this is another thing I like about the game is every character you can main. I actually had Brandon play and I got him main Tager. I got him play Tager. He got me into it. I end up maining Hazuma. But long story is. You can main any character you want and still have fun. There's no bad character. Yeah, people joke around called Carl one of the worst characters, but he's actually super he's the hardest characters to play. If you learn to play him, you can combo somebody and you cannot move at all. So each character is like easy to pick up and hard to master. Carl's hard to pick up. Hard, Carl is really hard to pick up because he's okay. two characters in one. Oh, I got you. Pretty much each character is different. Each character has a unique perk about them. Each character is different. Like there's a character who can stop time. There's a character who can literally... So there's a lot of diversity. Yeah, the entire cast is diverse. Even down to... 
Even down to the final boss, he what, which is an actual character. What kind of people would you recommend this game to? People who love fighting games? People who love, People like, like fighting games. People like a complex story, because the Boys Blue story is super confusing. Even I'm having problems to explain it, because it's just so confusing. Yeah. And, you know... Because, example, Calamity Trigger, the, all the endings are canon. The best stories are usually the ones that sometimes words can't even do justice. No. I and I would words. recommend this anybody. <clears throat> if you want, if you just want to play a fighting game just for fun, this kind of game for to play for fun, because every character you can play for fun. My main, I'll say this now, my main Selka, I can be a nine player. Any character can be any character. It's just how much skill you put into it. I would recommend it to anybody. Yeah. I, that definitely does sound like a fighting gamer's dream. So, thank you, thank you guys for bearing through this with us. Oh my God. I hope you found some favorites out of our top three games. I okay. apologize. <laughs> I know we... I forgive me. I know we had some fun with this one. We had a lot of fun. Forgive me. My top three games, you can... You can probably tell meant a lot of me, a lot to me, and the same goes for Brandon, Nathaniel, and Charles, all alike. Thank you for listening. Please check out these games. I'm gonna have them linked in the description if you're listening on YouTube when this becomes video format. But if you're listening on the podcast, I'll probably have like uh, our top ones uh, listed in the description just to keep things brief. But of course, check out these games, watch their trailers, give them a chance. You're going to fall in love with their characters and their stories because that's where we really fell in love with these games. With the thing, more so, it might have been the game mechanics, but you can't go wrong with these games. No, I fell in love with the characters. The Hollow Knight doesn't say a word, and I fell in love with them. There you go. Like, storytelling without needing words or storytelling through images is, like, probably some of the most powerful things for me. Obviously, some of these games might be older games where you yeah. might not be able yeah. to get. The original, like, there, you, you can cool. buy the entire, actually, I recommend this now, you can buy the entire Boys Boo series on Steam. In terms of, like, yeah. Spyro, you might want to get, like, a reignited version play that. Yeah. Really good. And a lot of these games have remaster collections, yeah. too. So you don't just, yeah. you're not just limited to one option, but you can get them on more recent consoles. Definitely check them out. So... We're going to plug in our social media so you can find ways to contact us should you have any questions or just want to get to know us or become part of the community for Kickback Boys. So you can find us on Facebook on our page at Kickback Boys. Simple as that. On Twitter, you can find us at Kickback Boys 1. We always post updates on our YouTube channel and you'll see us maybe like liking and retweeting different gaming related things. On Twitter, you can find me at Xavier789 underscore zero zero. On Twitter, on Instagram, you can find me at Evans00 Xavier. I'm more so been using uh, Instagram very slowly. I'm on my uh, art page where I occasionally post sketches and things that I'm working on on Imaginary000 Dreams. That's where I'm posting my art. On Twitter, you can follow me at Vextro55, V E X T R O 55. Um, on Instagram, you can follow me at the Dank Seventy Seven. I haven't really posted anything on there recently, but I might start putting my drawings that I've been doing recently or other stuff like that. Uh, on Twitter, you can find me at So Swag Nathan, and on Instagram, find me at So Swag Nathan Nineteen. Um, on Facebook, you can look for the Santa Rita. You can. You don't have to plug it if you don't want that one. But did you say yeah. your Twitter? Because remember, yeah, we're all on the Facebook page. Of we're course. all on the Facebook page. Doesn't if matter. you find us somehow, if you want to find me personally, you feel free. for me, you find me on Instagram. Yeah, I went dead again, but that was because it was, I didn't feel like taking pictures of like 50 hours of just me grinding. But you find me at Charles Brock 69. I do have a plan right now. And I'll be commissioning people, random people, to do ray arts for me. I'll be posting probably on Instagram. Aside from that, you guys have been listening to the kickback. You guys have been listening to the kickback hypercast. This has been your host, Xavier Evans. This has been your co-host, Brandon. This has been your co-host, Nathaniel. This has been a failure of a failure of a human, Charles. (laughs) Not far off the bat. We'll see you guys next time. Okay, we'll see you. Give me. I see you next time.